Okay, let's get started. Just a reminder to shut your laptops and silence your phones. Um, let me start with a few announcements. So there is a lab view this week. Do you want to? Thursday, right? Yeah. Okay. So some of you have had some issues with uh, creating proper zip files and uploading it to uh, grade school, but I believe we addressed that. Some others had some issues with test cases failing and uh, uh, with the segmentation point, we clarified how you need to pass arguments to uh, exact to avoid crashes and whatnot. So I hope that with those clarifications, it's more or less a straightforward lab. Uh, make sure you cover it in sooner rather than later, because the other thing you should now start worrying about is there is actually an exam coming up. Okay, so looks like the semester just started, but it's already exam time. So uh, let me say a little bit about the exam. The exam will be an in-class exam a week from today. Okay. Uh, yeah. So October 4th. <laughs> uh, so almost a month has gone by. So I will give you a sample exam and some sample solutions so you can get some sense of what the exam looks like. Okay. Every week uh, at the discussion section, I have been handing out the, a week's review, which explains what you should have learned from that week, what you should know, what you should be able to do. That's a very good study guide, okay? So make sure you look at that review material uh, and uh, review either the lecture slides or the textbook. All the videos are up on YouTube. If you have to go back and review or if you missed that class, so there's plenty of material for you to go and review, but you do need a little bit of time to do it. So just to go back to the format of the exam, it's going to be in-class exam, 75 minutes, closed book, closed notes. Okay, uh, not an evening exam, it's going to be in the class during the lecture. Okay, and uh, you should expect a mix of questions. Some of them are going to just ask you to explain a concept in brief. A few others might give you problems to solve. Okay, maybe something to do with scheduling or something else that requires you to write a little bit of pseudocode. Okay, so you will see that kind of flavor when I put up the sample exam. Okay, so Yes. Do you think it's after today? Yes, a week from If any of you have any conflict as defined by your three policies on what an exam conflict is, you should let me know this week. Don't come at the last minute and make me scramble to address that. If you are registered with disability services, we will work with disability services for administering your test. Okay, everyone else needs to come here and take the test in class. Any questions? Yes. Um, this is a message that we have. Yeah. Uh, just to make sure, it's due on Thursday, not tomorrow, right? Because the rule says tomorrow, I believe. Or at least I saw it that it said it pretty much. Whatever it says on the web page of the lab is when it's due. If Moodle has the wrong submission date, we will fix it. Okay? But as I said, don't wait until the last minute to do it because you should be studying for the test as well. Okay? You are welcome to submit as many times as you want uh, on grade scope. Okay. And so I want the test pass, at least your test is correct. We put a grading rubric on the lab. Okay. Don't assume that just because all your tests have passed, you are going to get 100. Okay. The tests only constitute 70% of the grade. There is a design doc, your return, and you have to document your code, write some comments, and a few other things. Okay. So make sure you do all of that. Yes. Those are the only okay. uh, this point is in on grade, so let's not complicate things and turn it in on Moodle. Okay. So basically the Moodle submission date doesn't matter because we just look at the grade scope times. Any other questions? Okay, so let's get started with the lecture. So just to remind you, last time we were talking about threads. Okay, and I explained that threads are essentially a stream of execution through a program. Okay, each program, a process, can have multiple threads of control running through it. Each thread is executing some piece of that code. So you can have multiple entities executing different parts of the code of the same process. Okay, I showed you this example. 
where there is a main function, there's a producer function, and there's a consumer function. When the pro process starts up, there's a main thread, and it creates two child threads. Okay, one is going to go and execute the producer function, and the other executes the consumer function. So this is the memory layout. You will see there are two program counters, one associated with each thread. Each of them is executing code in that function, and these two threads execute concurrently. Okay, If there's one processor, they will take turns, so uh, executing that process as the process gets scheduled. If you have multiple cores, they may actually execute in parallel. Okay? You can have as many threads as you want in your process. It allows you to implement your process in a concurrent fashion and a modular fashion where each thread is doing some part of the work for your application. Okay? That is the concept you want to keep in mind. Uh, now, what I want to do for the rest of the class okay, is to explain how threading is implemented in the operating system. But the real goal for us here is to understand what OS level support you need. Okay, so let's start looking at that a little bit. So I'm going to uh, explain two types of threading packages. Okay, regardless of what language you have, uh, you're using threads in, underneath, okay, threading is implemented one in two ways. Okay, you can either have kernel level threads or you can have user level threads. What kernel level thread means is that the threading package, for whether it's C or Java or whatever your language is, the threading package is implemented using kernel support. The OS kernel is going to be aware of the presence of threads within a process. Okay? It is going to explicitly manage the creation and the disruption of threads as well as the scheduling of threads. Okay? And in contrast, a user level threads package says that uh, threading support is implemented as a user level library by that language. Okay? You are not using any specific OS support to manage threads. Okay? OS is in this case only going to manage processes but not threads within that process. Okay? A user level library is actually going to manage the creation and scheduling of threads for us. Okay? So let's look at these two types of threading packages in a little more detail. Okay? Now, if you have a kernel level threads package, okay, so the kernel is going to be aware of the presence of these threads. So the kernel is now not only going to schedule a process for execution when you run the CPU scheduler, it's actually going to pick a specific thread to run. Okay? So now you're no longer scheduling processes, you're explicitly scheduling a thread from a process. So what you will have on your ready queue are a list of threads okay, from many different processes and you're explicitly scheduling threads and in doing so, you're also scheduling a process, okay? So the CPU schedulers will generalize easily to kernel level threads because what you're now going to have in your ready queues are explicitly threads. So if you have three threads, you will have three entries okay, that are queued up if they're all ready to run. Okay. Now you need to extend your process control block when you have kernel level threads packages to also store information about threads. In, when you had a single threaded process, your process control block had a set of registers. Now, you are going to have a set of registers for each thread in your process. Okay, because each thread, if you see the previous slide, has its own program counter, has its own stack. So you can see that each thread has its own program counter, own stack and so on. So when you have uh, threads that are not running, all of their state has to be stored in the process control block. So you need to have space for registers, program counters, stack pointers, and so on in the PC before every thread belonging to that process. Okay? Uh, now, memory management information is common across the threads because all threads are going to share the same address space. They all share the port segment. They each have their stack, but that stack is part of that process. And heap is shared as well. Now, switching between kernel threads is going to be somewhat faster than switching between processes. When you have context switches, if the next entity that you pick for execution happens to be another thread of that same process, okay? switching between the, the thread that is being evicted and the thread that is going to run next is going to be faster than switching between two independent processes. Okay? The reason for this is memory management information will not change. Okay, both of those threads belong to the same process, so they share the same memory management information. So you don't have to save all the state of the process, you only need to save the state of the registers, you don't need to 
save and restore memory management state because it's the same uh, process that's getting scheduled, just a different thread of that process. Okay, so context switches between kernel level threads of that same process is faster than switching between threads of two different processes or switching between two independent processes. Yes. Uh, does the time slice of the process get divided up? Okay. Question is, if you have kernel level threads, will the time slice of the process get divided up between the kernel level? So the time slice is going to be independent of whether your threads or not. That's a system level parameter. Okay. So whenever you pick a thread, it's going to get the same time slice whether you had picked a process or a thread. What that also means is if you have more lots of threads within a process, the aggregate CPU time you are going to get will be more than processes that are fewer threads because you will schedule all of those threads in the aggregate, they'll get more CPU time because each of them gets a full time slice. Okay, yes? Does each thread have its own process control block or is it like upper level? Okay, process question is does each thread have its own process control block or is that stored in something? So, by a process control block, we will mean one entry for that entire process. The process has more than one thread. You can assume that there's a thread control block, although I didn't use that term. So each PCB might have more than one thread control blocks, which will be used for thread specific information. Okay? So there's only one PCB per process, but you can have some threads within the process. Any other questions? Okay, so this is kernel level threads. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about user level threads. Okay, so if you implement threading support for any language using a user level threads library, then it's implemented without any explicit kernel support. So OS does not have to support threads at all. Okay, so if, the, if you have a kernel that does not have explicit support for threading, you can still implement threads in your user level program using a user level threads library. Okay, so in this case, the OS knows nothing about the presence of threads at all. To the OS, this looks like a traditional single threaded process, even though it can actually have threads inside it. This is because the OS is not managing the thread, so it looks uh, like a, to it, it looks like the process is a single threaded process. So whenever it schedules a process for execution, you will actually need to run a scheduler, a thread scheduler in the library, which will then decide which thread is actually going to run. Okay? So scheduling in case of user level threads package is a two level decision. Your kernel scheduler will run and it will pick a process. It doesn't know whether this process is a traditional single-threaded process or a multi-threaded process. Suppose it is a multi-threaded process, then those threads are managed by a user-level library. So then the user-level library runs its own scheduler that says this kernel, uh, this, the kernel has chosen the process for execution, which thread should actually execute in the next time slot. Okay? So now it's completely up to the, the library to decide what gets to run independent of whatever the kernel is doing. Kernel is only scheduling processes. It is not explicitly scheduling threads within a process. Unlike kernel level threads packages where the CPU scheduler directly picks a thread for execution. Okay? In this case, you are going to just pick a process and then the scheduler of the threads library is going to pick a thread. Okay? And uh, this same thread library is also responsible for creation and deletion of threads in addition to scheduling threads. So if you say create a thread, you actually go to the threads library and it makes a new thread for you. Okay? In a kernel level threads package, if you say create a thread, that's a system call. Just as fork was a system call that created a process, okay, you will actually have a system call to create a new thread for that process. And that system mm -hmm. call will go and allocate new entries in your thread control block and so on and so forth. Okay? In this case, it's just a function call to a library and the library manages all of the things. Okay? So that's a thread level, uh, uh, user level thread package. Okay, so here's a picture that shows you a little bit of details here. So you, that like, line is the line that divides user level processes and the kernel. Okay, inside the kernel you see each process as a single threaded process regardless of whether they actually have threads or not. Okay, so here you have, have an actual single threaded process. Okay? So that's the one in the middle. And then you'll see the one to the left and the right are processes that have user level threads in them. They're not visible to the kernel. Okay? So the kernel, in this case, is going to take your ready queue and pick one of these threads. 
and then if you pick that one, the thread level scheduler will run and it will have its own queue. It has kept inside the library, which will pick which one gets to execute. Yeah, so it's a two level decision. Yes, question. Um, I'm just I'm having a little bit of trouble kind of understanding proxy versus thread. So process, they, they both execute different code. You can import the process and it'll execute the code you import. Then you can do the same thing with you can make multiple threads and it'll execute that code. Is the difference that multiple processes make new memory for the code or is it thread? Code? Okay, so to so this Differentiate between them, don't, let's not compare multiple processes with multiple threads. Compare a single process with a single, another process that has more than one thread. So the right comparison is a single threaded process, which is what we call a traditional process and a multi-threaded process. Okay? So in one case, there's no concurrence. Okay? There's only one thing executing within that process. As one instruction you can execute at any given time, no concurrency at all. And if you start multiple threads within that process, you get concurrency, but each thread can execute a separate instruction okay, within that process. Okay, so <coughs> two threads, they could execute two different functions or instructions within two different functions concurrently. Okay? So there could be different processes. You still have processes. Now we just generalize what's inside a process. Okay, in one case, you will have concurrency inside a process. In the other case, you will have no concurrency. That's the way to think about it. Yes. What do you mean by concurrency? I thought it still had to context switch concurrency. Okay, that's a good question. The so question is what do you mean by concurrency? Okay, so concurrency. So here let's take this producer and consumer uh, code that we have. So so there are two functions here. Okay? If you had a single threaded process, only one of those functions would execute, okay? And then that function would have to return and you would have to call another function for the other function to execute. While this function is executing and it hasn't returned back to the main, you could never execute the consumer code at all. Because at one point you can call one function and when the function returns, you can call another function. That's the way it functions. Okay. If you had a multi, that's in a single threaded process. If you have a multi-threaded process, essentially that main has called both of these functions. You have created a thread that's going to execute this function and while the function is still executing, you actually called another function that's being executed by a separate thread. Okay. Now your concurrency, which says while this function is executing, okay, you can switch to this other thread and execute some code of this other function as well. Okay, that is what we have meant by concurrency in this case. You do have to switch between them, okay, but you are executing code of both of them. Now if you actually have a multi-core system, like you have a dual core machine, then these two threads might get scheduled on two different cores and they will actually execute in parallel. So you will get true parallelism, which you could never get in a single thread process. Okay, yes. We did something similar to this when we did like multiple processes with like message sharing or memory sharing. So is the benefit just it's like less overhead to do this type of thing? Okay, so the question is we had something similar when we had uh, uh, multiple processes. So you can also have multiple processes that are part of the same application. Okay, and then so those processes collectively work together to execute the application and you're switching between code of the application. Okay? Now that is more heavyweight. Okay? This is more lightweight. It's basically in both cases from an application standpoint you get concurrency. You would have implemented this code but this was one process. This whole thing was a different process and they were using message passing. That would give you exactly the same behavior except that in that case context switches are very heavyweight. You're switching between processes. Here it's the same code. You just have an array within that code. Okay? That's just a simple array that's shared. Your question. Um, like how can you only threads that can be run on multiple cores? Because you can use the threads then if it relies on the process being scheduled. So yes. So I will come to advantages and disadvantages, but let me answer your question. So the question is uh, if, if you have multiple cores, okay, do you need kernel level threads to actually get true parallelism? The answer is yes, because if the if you are user level threads, the OS doesn't know that there is more than one thread. So it can only schedule that process once. Okay, and then that will execute on one core. Even if it has more than one thread, you will not schedule the process on two different cores. Because it's, to the OS, it looks like a single thread process. So I put another way, if you want to take advantage of true parallelism on multiple cores, you have to use kernel level threads, or you have to use multi-process applications. Okay, you can actually partition your code into processes, and those will then run on two different cores. Okay? Yes. Do we have any kind of uh, parent-child hierarchy running 
causing that. Okay, question is, are there parent-child hierarchies when it comes to threads? So just as processes have parent-child hierarchies, so do threads, but the OS doesn't explicitly track that. Okay, in the case of processes, there's an explicit tracking of which process created which other processes, but clearly if a thread creates another thread, that's a child thread. Okay? But there is no explicit uh, tracking because there is no such thing as fork as you will see here. Okay, the reason you needed the parent-child relationship is the way a fork was designed. Okay, because the fork explicitly had different behavior in the parent and child and that's how you use it. In this case, you will see that you can just say, essentially create a thread, which is that fork thread call. Okay, and that just essentially starts executing that code and that's it. Okay, yes. So what if you have, like a parent, they call it, let's call it a parent thread, calls another thread, and if something happens to a parent thread, and the parent thread crashes, um, what's going to happen? Okay, so question is if the parent child thread has a child thread and the parent thread terminates, what is going to happen to the child? Okay, now the answer to that depends on how the parent actually terminated. If the parent had a segmentation fault and it crashed, the whole process will crash and all the threads will crash with it. Okay, the process, the parent thread did a graceful exit, okay, which is what you see here, and the child threads continue executing. You see that there's a main thread there. That basically initialize some data structures, created two threads, and there is an end. It's not waiting for the child thread to finish. So in that case, the parent thread, all it did was create two children and it terminated. The child threads continue to live on, they sit in the infinite loop. In this case, that's exactly the scenario you're talking where the parent can die, but the child can. Okay, yes, question. Um, in this example, I see that all of the global variables are there. Yeah, so that's a good point. So when you have threaded code, what comes for free is in all the threads, all global data structures are shared. Okay, so that's basically going to come, that's just like calling any function, right? Any function, whether it was threaded or not, it would access all global variables. Same is true if you're thread because the thread is essentially sharing the heap and uh, so on. So anything that's global will be accessible directly. Okay, in all of the threads. Okay, anything that's local has to be explicitly passed as parameters like before. Okay, but all global variables are shared, you can freely access it, but you should use synchronization, which is what we look at, locks and so on. You shouldn't just go and do that. Okay, that's going to go and oh, trample your buffer and create a corruption. Okay, that's not correct code, it's just to show you concurrency. Okay, any other questions? So it's very important to understand what threads are because uh, you will not only use it in the lab, you need to understand how the OS is implementing it. If you don't understand what this is, then you don't know what the OS is supposed to do. Okay, so you should understand that this is essentially giving you concurrency inside a process. There are other ways to implement concurrency as we just discussed, which is multiple processes that are part of the same application. Okay, and there are pros and cons of doing that, which we will not go into here, okay, but you will see that some things are uh, designed as multi-process application. Okay? Chrome is a good example of that. In Chrome, when you create a tab, okay, typically the tab is a separate process. Okay? The reason is if the, if the tab uh, has run some JavaScript and has some problem and it crashes, it doesn't take the browser down when it only that process crashes. If you had implemented tabs as threads, which you could have easily done so, okay, if the tab crashes, the entire browser will crash with it. So there are some advantages and disadvantages. But switching between tabs in Chrome is going to be more heavyweight. That's a full context switch. Okay? Switching between threads is extremely lightweight. Okay? So you will basically have more scheduling overhead but more robustness to handle bugs. In this case, it's more lightweight. Okay? So you have all these trade-offs that you have to worry about. Okay? So I talked about kernel level and user level threads. Let's talk about advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so I'll talk about advantages of user level threads and then some disadvantages. Okay? So first of all, the main advantage of user level threads is extremely lightweight in nature. Okay, all of the threads are managed at by a user level library. Okay? So all thread management calls are essentially function calls, not system calls. Okay? Create a thread is a function call to the library. Okay? In a kernel level thread, create a thread becomes a system call to the OS. 
Yeah, and it should be clear that function calls are much cheaper than system calls. Yeah, because function call, you just call as some piece of code inside your process. System call requires you to suspend the process, switch to the OS, execute the system call, switch back to the process. Much more heavyweight operation. Okay? So essentially it is extremely lightweight. Okay? All of the user level management call. The other thing is when you want to switch between threads in a user level threads package, there is no kernel level context switch. It's a user level switch where the thread library essentially suspends the thread and it starts executing the next thread okay, just as a CPU scheduler would do. But there is no kernel level context which is involved. So switching between user level threads is also extremely lightweight. Unlike switching between kernel level threads, which requires a kernel level context. Okay. User level thread scheduling is also more flexible. You are no longer bound by whatever your kernel scheduling policy, whether it's MLFQ or round robin or lottery scheduling. Okay, it doesn't matter. Once you have chosen this process for execution, the user level thread scheduler can use any arbitrary policy it wants. Okay? More interestingly, different processes running on the same system can use different libraries that use different schedulers. The scheduling policy is <coughs> uh, tied to that one process. Another process that's running on the same system can use a different library, which uses a different user level thread scheduler. Okay. So you have the flexibility of picking which scheduling policy you want for your code, depending on what the code is trying to do. Okay, whether it's round robin or lottery scheduling or some other uh, policy. Okay. So those are all advantages. There are no system calls needed. It's all threads, um, uh, calls to the library, and they are also much more lightweight. Okay. So that's all good stuff. Okay. Yes. Um, so when the thread is um, sort of the user of the scheduler, how does it um, stop a thread from being successful? Okay. Question: How does a user level thread stop a thread from executing when a time slice expires? So the user level thread can do whatever it wants. Okay. You want to implement your user level thread in your scheduler, no different from how you implement a kernel scheduler. Okay. It will start a timer. Okay. It's a user level timer. Just, uh, and then when the timer expires, that will get a signal to call an exception handler. The exception handler will terminate, not terminate, but we schedule the thread and schedule the next thread. Okay? So you mimic whatever the OS was doing in your library. Okay? Typically, the programmer doesn't see any of this. The programmer is simply calling create a thread and doing something. Inside, something is going to have to do all of that, okay? which is your threading library. Okay, so now let's look at disadvantages. Okay, so the disadvantages of user level threads are the following. Okay? The OS does not know of the presence of threads. We saw that there was a good thing in certain cases, but there are also disadvantages to that. Okay? One disadvantage is that if your application forks 100 user level threads, you are going to get the same amount of CPU time as another process that has only two threads. Okay? So the OS doesn't know what's inside a process. Are there threads, are there 100 threads, 3 user level threads, you just don't know. So you just give it a time slice as if it was a single thread process. The fact that there are more threads doesn't get you anything. Okay? In kernel level threads, if you have 100 threads, you will have 100 things queued up on your ready queue, assuming they are all ready to run, and each of them is going to get an independent time slice. So collectively, that process is going to get more time, more CPU time, if you have kernel level threads. Okay? You do not have that advantage in the case of user level. Okay, because the OS doesn't know, it can't schedule that process more often just because it has thread, because it doesn't know <coughs> that it has threads at all. Okay. That's one problem. Okay, the second problem is if one thread inside a user level thread package blocks on I.O., the entire process is going to block. Okay, the whole process is going to go off and sit on the wait queue. Okay. The fact that there are other threads in that process that are ready to run is not known to the OS. Okay, it just sees that some thread has done some I.O. Okay? Okay, which as soon as you do I.O., you go and sit on the wait queue. Okay, so the entire process starts waiting if any thread waits in case of user level. In kernel level threads, that's not the case. Okay, because each thread is being scheduled independently okay, by the uh, OS. If one thread does I.O. or does a system call, only that thread goes on the wait queue. Okay? The other thread might still be in the ready queue and can continue to run. Okay, so in this case, uh, you can still make progress for the process. So in this example, 
Okay, going back to this example, if there were print statements in either the producer or the consumer, the producer did a print. Okay, producer thread did a print. If it was user level thread, the entire process will block, which means the consumer thread won't run until the I/O is done. Okay, if you had kernel level thread, the producer thread did a print. Okay, only the producer thread blocks. The consumer thread will still get some CPU time. Okay, until it also does I/O or some such thing. So, so if any thread does I/O and user level threads, all threads block. Okay, so that's a disadvantage. So these are all of the disadvantages of user level thread and the final thing is you cannot get true parallelism. I already mentioned this. If you have user level threads, it doesn't matter how many threads you have, uh, how many cores you have, you only run that one process. So you cannot get true parallelism. Kernel level threads, you will get true parallelism. Okay? So I am not going to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of kernel level threads. Because all you have to do is take the disadvantages of user level threads and they will become advantages of kernel level threads and vice versa. So everything I said doesn't work in one case, works for the other. Okay, so you just have to flip the slides and you will get the advantages and disadvantages. Okay? So are there any questions here before I move on? Okay. So these are all OS level considerations. Okay, what should the kernel do? Okay, the, other, the final thing I should mention about user level threads is you can have threading support in a OS that does not have explicit support for threads by using user level threads. Okay, the reason user level threads came to exist is in the early days, okay, the OS kernel only supported traditional processes, which are single threaded processes. And the only way to implement threading was to write a threading library that allowed the process to start creating threads within that process. Okay? So put another way, you can actually have execute multi-threaded code using user level thread on an OS that has no support for threads at all. Okay? So today most general purpose kernels will have some support for threads. So if you are writing a threading pattern, you are better off taking advantage of the kernel support for it. But if you didn't have, if you had an XS stripped down OS and wanted to implement threads, user level threads are the only way to go unless you go and change the kernel code and add explicit support for it. Okay, yeah, well, I, think my answer, I was wondering if there's ever a situation where you might want to use both, or is it sort of just choose? Yeah, so a question is, do, should you want to choose both? There might be a specialized case where if you want to do, do your own thread scheduling for whatever reason, user level threads are the only way to go. Because you are, if you use kernel level thread, you're stuck with the kernel scheduler. Okay, so that's a good reason to do it, but now you won't get to take advantage of parallelism and things like that. So that's the downside of it. But you can certainly use both. Yeah, there's no issues with doing that. Any other question here? Okay. So, so that's just an example which I'm going to uh, ignore. So here are some uh, pictures that are going to show us how threads within a process get mapped onto entries within within the curve okay, or the thread control block entries within a process control block. Okay? And depending on what kind of threading support you have, whether it's kernel level threads or user level threads, you will get one of these different scenarios. Okay? Uh, at the top is what is the, uh, the picture that is going to be relevant for user level threads, where your multiple threads inside a process that get mapped onto one entity that the kernel knows about. This is one process control block. Okay, which we'll call a kernel thread, but that, that name is a misnomer. It's really a schedulable entity inside the kernel. So the kernel has one schedulable entity for the entire process, and whenever it gets scheduled, all of that process share the time that is given to that schedulable <coughs> entity. So this is called a many-to-one mapping. Many user-level threads are mapped onto one entity that the kernel is going to schedule okay, in a user-level, uh, in a single user-level thread packet. Yeah, which is perceived as a single threaded process by the So the picture here shows you the same process that's implemented as a kernel like using a kernel level threads packet. So for every thread within the process, there is an explicit entity inside the kernel that tracks that process and schedules it explicitly. Okay? So this is a one-to-one -one mapping as, it, uh, as opposed to many-to-one mapping. So there are, as you will see, for four threads inside the process, there are four entries inside the kernel that get scheduled, okay, one for each thread. Okay, so this is basically 
a picture that you will should keep in mind for a kernel level test time. So what this picture is showing is what is inside the process and what does the kernel know about the process in terms of scheduling. Okay. So these are two examples of a, what you will see typically in the user level threads package and the kernel level threads package. The picture at the bottom are more complicated mappings from user level thread to kernel level threads. Okay. So in this case, you have a many to many mapping. Okay. You have four user level threads. You have three entities inside the kernel, okay? and you will see that they are mapped in a many-to-many -many fashion. Okay? What that means is if the CPU a scheduler said, let's execute that entity, okay? then there is a decision to be made, you can execute any of the entities that are mapped onto it. Okay? So, and then something has to decide, if this gets scheduled, which of those four will get scheduled. Okay? In this case, if this entity gets scheduled, the thread that's mapped onto it is the one that's actually going to execute. Okay? Because that's a kernel level thread, uh, scheduling decision. In this case, if that entity gets scheduled, you will run a user level library that's going to pick one of those four threads. That's the user level scheduler. Okay? So in one to one and many to one mapping, the scheduling is uh, clear. Here is a more complicated scenario where you say there are four user level threads, but I only need three entities inside the kernel. They don't need four. Okay? And then Whenever any of these are scheduled, you will actually run another scheduler, a sec to second line scheduler that will pick whatever is mapped onto it. Okay. Complicated uh, uh, thread management can be done in this fashion okay, if you know what you are doing for your application. Okay. There are thread level packages that will allow you to decide how your thread gets mapped onto a kernel level entity. Okay. By default, if you use a kernel level thread package and say create a thread, that's what is going to happen. We will create a new thread control block and simply map the new process, a new thread onto that thread control block. And that's the end of it. But you can say, I don't need a separate thread control block. This thread does not need to be explicitly scheduled. It can share uh, CPU time with other threads that are mapped onto that thread control block. And then you will essentially have scenarios like this. Okay? This requires a programmer to write code to have this kind of mapping. And you will see that there's another mapping here where you have four threads that are shared by these three kernel level scheduling entities and a fifth thread that is given its own kernel level scheduling. So maybe this is a more important thread so that it gets more CPU time and then these four threads basically share the CPU time allocated to those other entities. Okay. So these are all things you will see in more complicated threading applications, threaded Typically, you will see one of those two things at the top, but you should know that you can construct many to many mappings as well. Okay, so um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say uh, about the threading models. Okay, but those two at the top are the more common ones. Okay, the first one is user level threads, the second one is kernel level threads. Any questions here? Right. So I'm going to quickly show you some thread libraries. Okay, so as I said, any thread library that you will uh, should, uh, that you see okay, is internally implemented either using kernel level threads or user level threads. Okay? So if you use all of your written Java code, okay, Java has inbuilt support for threads. Okay? Now when you write Java code, you don't worry about whether the JVM okay, is written using user or kernel level threads. That's not your problem as an application program. The JVM designer has to make that decision. Okay, if you are writing a JVM for Linux or a new JVM for Windows, the, the JVM designer has to decide should you implement threads within Java using kernel level support or user level support. Okay? And the same is true for C or C++. You might, use, you might use a threading package like pthread, which I'm going to show you in just a second. And pthread designer has to make that decision. Okay? Now, uh, your code is going to run similarly no matter what. So you are going to write the same code. The API has not changed. How threading is implemented internally has actually changed. Okay, so, thread libraries will have the same API to the programmer. Okay, so, you will have the same Java code. It will run no matter whether the JVM is implemented using user or kernel level threads. Okay, so, that is something that you have to decide when you implement the JVM itself. Okay, so, having said that, I am going to talk about or two threading packages, but mention three. Okay. So P threads, or what are also called POSIX threads, are a standard threading package that is used by C or C++. 
it's available on most common platforms. Okay, you can run POSIX thread code on Mac OS, you can run it on Linux, even Windows has support for POSIX thread. Okay, so it's a cross-platform threading packet. Okay, the code will run, you have to recompile it for different platforms. Okay, so uh, that's a common threading package that you will see. Okay, it was something that was implemented initially for Unix like operating systems, but most of the platforms today support POSIX threads. I'm going to show you an example of this. Okay. Now Windows has its own native thread implementation called Win32 and Win64 threads, okay, which are similar to POSIX thread, but the API is slightly different. And in fact, the Windows implementation of P threads is essentially a wrapper okay, that internally uses Win32 threads. So those are the native threads that you have. So you simply take the Win32 calls and then re uh, write wrapper code to export them as POSIX32 calls or the POSIX threads calls okay, using. Uh, Win32 or Win64 threads. Okay, and then the other common threading package are Java threads. Okay, so again in Java, threading is part of the language itself. Okay, so all JVMs will support Java threads and then you will use the standard Java code to implement threads. Again, this can be done in one of uh, two ways. Okay, but let me show you a little bit of code, uh, just two step, three snippets of code to show how to create a thread. Okay, so at the top, you have essentially a, a P thread call to create a thread, and this one is a Win32 call, and this is essentially a, a call in Java. Okay, they all create a thread either in C, C++, or Java. Okay, so here you are going to essentially uh, use a call called P thread attribute in it, which will set some default attributes for the thread, and then you call P thread create. Okay, P thread create is similar to a fork. Fork creates a process. P thread create, creates a thread within that process. So I'm going to create a new process. It's going to take the pro, uh, process that calls this code and create a new thread within that process. Okay? And then the thread that is created gets its own thread ID. Okay? Just as every process has a unique ID, every thread has a unique ID inside a process. Okay? So there's a process ID for the whole process and each thread has an ID within that process. So as you create new threads, each thread gets its own ID. Yeah, so when you create P thread create, it's going to return a thread ID to you. Okay. This is Win32 call, where the call is called create thread. Okay. And it's very similar. Okay, you pass some parameters and you get a thread ID. Okay, that creates a thread inside a Windows program. Maybe it's a C sharp program or some such thing. Visual C++ program. This is what you do in Java. Okay, you just have to do new thread and you give it an object that will create a new thread and then you basically say start and it will start executing some code. Okay. Just some now snippet to show you how threads are created. Now of course there are many other threading calls, not just creating threads, but uh, I just wanted to show you a simple example of how to go about it. Okay. Any questions? Okay, when you write code, this is what you use. Okay, you don't worry about is this user level, kernel level, level, that's not really your concern as a program. Okay? As an OS designer, as a library uh, designer, you need to think about those things. Yes. So when we call the thread, uh, does the execution also start from um, where it was called from or does it start from the Okay, so the question is when you start a thread, where does it start executing? You will uh, see that when you actually call a thread, you pass it a function, okay, and it starts executing that function when it starts up. Okay, processes start executing from main. Okay? For a thread, you say you start a thread and start with this function. So you give it a starting function, and that is the function it starts executing. Okay? Threads will not start executing main, for example, when you create a new thread. Any other question? Okay. So with that. I am going to switch gears and talk about another important aspect of threading which is synchronization. Okay. Anytime you are going to use threads in any code, you have to worry about synchronization because threads are concurrent. Okay. When you have concurrency, bad things can happen in your code. Okay. And you can use synchronization to ensure correctness and not have one thread and trample on data that's being written to by another thread and so on. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about 
what is synchronization give you some definitions I'm going to go through this example of too much milk which I don't know if you have but you might have seen this in 230 already yeah, but if you have, it doesn't matter we'll go through it again and then we we'll use that to motivate locks okay, which is going to be a first synchronization primitive we are going to see three different ways of doing synchronization we'll do locks then we'll do semaphores and then we'll do monitors okay. in addition to understanding what these primitives are and how to use them correctly when you write threaded code our goal here is to see how you use OS support to implement it okay. at some level a course like 230 should have given you basic exposure to synchronization okay. in this case our real goal is to see how you are going to implement synchronization using OS support just as we said kernel level threads okay, we have to say okay locks how does an OS support locks what primitives are needed inside the kernel to support locks and so on. But I'm going to assume that you may not know much about synchronization, even though you have encountered it in 230. So we will go through and we will introduce each of these primitives first, understand how to use it in application level code, and then see how to go about implementing it. Okay, so you will learn how to do synchronization and see how to implement synchronization in the OS. Okay, so both of those things are going to be part of what we study here. Okay, so let's start with the recap. Okay, so it's a recap because I'm assuming this slide is the uh, part of P30. Okay, so uh, just to motivate why you need synchronization. Okay, so we, we will uh, look at this problem called too much milk. Okay, where the, the scenario is as follows. You have a roommate. Okay, and you and your roommate have to ensure that you never run out of milk in your refrigerator. Okay. So the question is how can you coordinate with your roommate to ensure that uh, you have may always have some milk in the refrigerator. And here is a potential scenario that might occur. Okay. So let's say uh, you arrive to your home or your dorm room at 3. Okay. Look inside the refrigerator, say there is not no milk there, you are out of milk. So you go to the grocery. Yeah, to buy milk. Okay, so now while you are away, your roommate arrives home. Okay, uh, he or she opens your refrigerator and sees that there is no milk. Okay, and then they decide that uh, time to go buy milk and they leave for the grocery store. Okay, and then while they leave, you are back. Okay, you arrived at the grocery, you bought milk. You come home, you put milk in your refrigerator. Uh, your roommate arrives a short time later, buys milk comes home, puts milk in your refrigerator and now you have too much milk. That's why rather than hiding just enough, you bought too much. Okay. So this is where uh, coordination, there was really no coordination here and you went wrong and you bought too much milk. The question is how will you avoid this problem and uh, have right coordination to not ensure that you neither have no milk nor do you have too much milk. Okay. That's the motivation for learning about synchronization. Okay? Now if this was beer, you could never have too much beer. Okay, so then this would not be a problem. But this is milk, so we'll worry about how to get just enough milk. Okay? So synchronization, what does it mean? Okay. Essentially, the, the, the formal definition is you're going to use some atomic operations to ensure that threads can cooperate. Now the problem on the previous slide is there was no communication between you and your roommate. Your roommate had no idea that you had gone to buy some milk. Okay? Neither did you know when you came back that your roommate had actually gone to buy milk. So there has to be some communication and so there has to be some primitives that enables this co cooperation and communication and that's going to happen through synchronization. Okay? Communication in this case is not explicit, it's implicit okay? but you need some ways to figure out what's going on. Okay? And we'll define two other terms, one is called mutual exclusion and we'll call critical section. Okay? Mutual exclusion essentially says that only one thread can perform a certain operation at any given time. Okay? And if another thread tries to do the same operation, it is prevented from doing so. Okay? This is called mutual exclusion. So if you are a thread that is doing a particular activity, doing so excludes other threads from performing that activity. So what we want is to make buying milk 
a mutually exclusive operation. That means if one thread or one person is gone off to buy milk, the other person is prevented from going and buying milk. This is the only way you are going to avoid uh, getting too much milk. So you are going to use mutual exclusion to implement synchronization and critical section is a piece of code that only one thread can execute at a time. Okay? So mutual exclusion is typically implemented using what are called critical sections in your code. Okay? So you can take any piece of code, any function or any part of a function and say this is code that is going to be mutually exclusive okay? and then that uh, one should use the right primitives, that code can be executed by only one thread at a time. When another thread tries to concurrently execute the same piece of code, it is going to have to wait. It's going to be prevented from doing so. Okay? So critical sections are a way to implement mutual exclusion. Okay? So you'll see how to write critical sections and get mutual exclusion. Okay? And lock is going to be a way we are going to implement synchronization and mutual exclusion and get critical sections in your code. Okay? Essentially, it's a mechanism that is going to implement all of that. Okay? So the idea is going to be that you're going to lock a piece of code before uh, you execute it. That code becomes a critical section. And when you're done executing, you're going to unlock. Okay? So the notion of a lock is you put a lock on a piece of code. And if you hold a lock, other threads cannot execute it because you hold a lock on the code. And you see how to use it to implement critical sections. Okay? So the important thing is all synchronization will involve some waiting. Okay, because you have mutual exclusion, you are preventing other threads from executing. Okay, so if you are in a critical section, other threads have to wait. Other threads that want to execute that code have to wait. Okay, they can do other things. So let's try to understand with that uh, background how to go about solving uh, the too much milk problem. Okay, so we'll have three solutions and one is going to build on the other. Okay, so before we come up with any solution, Let's try to ask, what is it that we are trying to solve? What are the correctness properties we are trying to achieve? Okay. So the correctness property we want is uh, only one person should buy milk at a time. Okay. And someone should buy milk if you need it. Okay. So you don't want to both roommates or maybe there are more than two buying milk at the same time. Then you are going to have too much milk. Okay. That's the first correctness property. The second is you want someone to do something. A trivial solution to not having too much milk is nobody does anything. You are never going to have too much milk, so you are not going to have any milk at all. Okay? So being lazy is a good enough solution to not having too much milk, but that doesn't actually help. You want some milk. Okay? So the other correctness property is that someone should buy milk if, they, if you need it. Okay? If your fridge is empty, someone should buy milk. But only one person should buy milk at a time, not more than one. Okay, so both of those go hand in hand. Okay, so those are the two properties we need. So we are going to say, how are we going to do this? Okay, so we are going to... Hold on. So what we will do is we are going to use a way for you to <coughs> co cooperate with your roommate. Okay, in this case, we are going to switch from a human example to threads. We are going to say, let us assume the threads are tasked to buy email just to make this look a little more like programs rather than people who are coordinating. Okay. So we have thread A and thread B okay, and their tasks are to go buy milk. Okay, now how do we do this? We will assume that you can leave a note. Okay, the note indicates to the other thread that you are going to go and buy milk. Okay, so here is essentially the code for thread A. Okay. You say if there is no milk in the fridge, and there is no note on the fridge saying someone has gone off to buy milk. So the fridge is empty and there is no note on the fridge. Then you leave a note okay, saying I am going to go buy milk. And then you go actually buy milk. Okay, and then you remove the note. Okay? So that's the code for thread A. And thread B is going to do the exact same thing. It's going to check is there milk in the fridge. If there is no milk in the fridge, is there a note on the fridge saying someone has gone off to buy milk. And if there is no note, then you say, okay, the milk fridge is empty, there is no note. So leave a note saying, I'm going to go buy milk and go buy it. It seems straightforward. The question is, will this actually work? Yeah, will this actually ensure those two correctness properties for us? Yes. No. Okay. So what do you think will not work? Okay, 
So the suggestion that is being made is this is not going to work. And the way you are going to reason whether this works or not is the following. Okay? You should basically, the correctness is going to mean in our case that no matter in what order threads get scheduled, okay, you are going to get correct results. And it shouldn't matter when the thread gets context switch, which thread you switch to, the scheduler can do anything it wants. Okay? It's just scheduling threads. Okay? So you should have correct results, which means those two properties should always be satisfied regardless of the order in which the threads execute. You can't assume that this thread is going to always start first and do this and then that thread does that because when you simply run the process, you don't have any control. Or which thread gets to run, so what is the kernel going to pick, or whatever the CPU scheduler you are using, what is it going to pick, how much time slice are you given, when are you going to switch from one thread to another, is not under your control. Okay? The scheduler and the OS can do whatever they want. Okay? You want your code to always do the right thing, okay? never actually get tripped by some order of scheduling. Okay? So that is what we will mean by corrector. Those two properties have to be satisfied regardless of the order of execution of these threads, regardless of how they context switch from one thread to another. Okay? So now with that background, let me elaborate on what was actually mentioned here as a counter example to showing why this code will still fail, why you will still end up with too much milk despite leaving a note. Okay? So here is what could happen. Okay, let's say thread A gets scheduled first. Okay. It is then going to go and run the first statement. Okay, it's going to say, is there no milk? Let's assume there is no milk in the fridge. So you are going to check, is there no note? Let's also assume there is no note on the fridge. Okay. And then because those two conditions are true, it's going to enter the if statement. Okay. So now let us assume that that thread's time slice expires. So you basically have to context switch. So you basically ran out of your time slice. So you say, okay, I'm here. I'm about to leave a note, but I haven't executed the next statement. But I have switched okay, to another thread. And let's assume that thread B is going to run at some point. Okay? Now it is going to execute its first statement. Okay? It's going to check, is there milk in the fridge? There is still no milk in the fridge. Okay? Thread A hasn't even gone to buy milk. Okay? It's going to check, is there a note? There is still no note on the fridge because all that thread it did was it just checked the if statement, its time slice ran out. Okay? So you will basically still have no note when thread B executes. So this condition is still true. Okay? So if statement will basically be true and then you will enter, B will also enter the if statement. Okay? So now you are going to be in trouble. Okay? Because now it doesn't matter what what you do because both of those threads are in the statement at the same time. So let's say thread B continues executing, you leave a note, okay, you buy milk, you take the road off and then maybe your time slice expires and A which is basically here now resumes execution, you leave a note, you buy milk, you remove note, it's too late, now you have too much milk. Is that clear? So we found one sequence of execution where Scheduling them in this order has actually defeated the program from doing the right thing. Okay? That means this code does not work. There will be other sequences where the code may work perfectly fine. That does not matter. That the code is still wrong. Okay, so for example, you might have a time slice where all of this entire if statement runs in one go. So A runs, it checks these two things. Maybe there's no milk and no note. It then goes into the if statement, it leaves a note, it buys a milk, it removes a note, and now you have milk. And then B will run and you will say now there is milk, so it doesn't do anything. In this sequence, the code is going to do exactly what we would like it to do. But that doesn't mean the code is right, because we found at least one sequence where it actually does the wrong thing. If you find even one sequence of execution where your thread will actually do something incorrect, then your code is not going to be right. This is called a race condition. Okay. After when you write multi-threaded code, okay, you will have non-deterministic execution. Codes, threads will execute in arbitrary order. In certain orders, you may actually get wrong <coughs> results. But you run it again to debug it, now the, the big bug may be gone because it executes in a different order. Okay. So finding bugs in multi-threaded code can be notoriously problematic because the execution is not controlled by it. Every time you run this code, 
things may happen in a different order based on whatever the CPU scheduler is doing. Okay. But if there's a race condition and because of that race condition you have a bug where uh, the correctness properties are violated, the code is wrong. Okay. So you found a bug. Okay. It may not occur all the time. So many times the code may run perfectly fine, but every once in a while this bug might actually cause you to get incorrect results. Okay. So we'll assume that this is not acceptable. Any questions on this? So I'm going to so show you solution two, where we are going to try to be smart. Okay, here we are going to say let's leave notes and sign the note. Okay, let's see if that does anything for us. So uh, here, thread A is going to leave a note saying I may I'm going to go buy milk. Then you are going to check has B left a note? Okay, are you going to, you are going to check the note for B? If B has not left a note, okay, if B has left a note, you're just going to remove the note saying there is a note from B, I won't do anything. I'll just take my note off. But if there's no note from B, I will check is there milk. If there's no milk, you go buy milk, you remove your note. Okay. So in this case, you are going to leave the note signed by B. You're going to check is A left a note. If not, you go buy milk, and then you take your note off. So you signed your note. And then the question is, did they buy us anything? Are we going to get correct results? Okay, this is a different, slightly more complicated solution. Yes? Not a word. Okay. Because uh, you can execute the first line and close the reds. Okay, so here's a potential scheduling sequence that is being suggested, which is going to violate our second property. Okay, the first piece, first example, violated the first property. We have two correctness properties. Okay, we said only one person should buy milk at a time, which was clearly violated here. And the second one was someone should buy milk. So you should never have a case where no one buys milk. Okay, so here. Uh, we could have the following scheduling sequence. Okay, so you leave a note, okay, and then you check is there a note from B, okay, and then there is basically a, sorry, you leave a note. Okay, first statement executes, you leave a note. Okay. Now let's say the CPU scheduler says your time slice up. Okay, then B runs, it leaves a note. Okay, CPU scheduler says your time slice is off again. Okay, now there are two notes on your fridge, one from A and one from B. Okay. Now, let's say you switch back to A. Okay. It checks, is there a note from B? Okay. Answer is yes, because B ran and left a note. So A thinks it doesn't have to do anything. Okay. And now, so it's going to essentially not execute the if at all. But let's assume after it checks the if statement and finds that it's false, it time slice runs out again. Okay. Now you run B. Okay. So A has already checked and said it doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't take the note off. So B runs and it checks, is there a note from A? There is still a note from A. It says it doesn't have to do anything. Okay. So it will not enter the statement. And then both of them will essentially take that note off. Okay. Now there is, if there is no milk in your fridge, then essentially both of you have checked the note, assume that the other person is going to do the work and said, I don't have to do anything. And now neither of the threads has actually gone and gone. The same thing can happen over and over again. And if that happens, then you are basically going to violate your second property, where both threads leave a note, check whether there's a note from the other thread, they say yes, and then you take the note off, and nothing happens. So you don't buy milk, you're just putting notes and taking them. Okay? So if you scheduler schedule them in this order, again, you are not going to have any milk. In the previous case, you had too much milk, here you have no milk at all which is also an incorrect solution to your Again, I should emphasize that this order of scheduling may only occur rarely. This is a race condition. doesn't mean that every time you run the code, you are going to have this. Code may run perfectly fine in most cases where you leave a note, you check that there is no note from B, you go buy milk and you take the note off. And when A comes in, it might see that there is no note, but if there is milk, it will not go buy milk. So in many sequences, the code will run perfectly fine. But there will be certain CPU scheduling sequences where this problem will occur and hence the code is still wrong. It doesn't mean it's wrong all the time. 
in predict code, if you're wrong, sometimes you're still wrong. Even if you're wrong, correct 99% of the time, doesn't mean that you have correct code. Okay. If you have a race condition, even if it is rare, you still have incorrect code. So yes. Um, in this case, wouldn't the read node be an IO? Yeah, so if the, I think that it doesn't matter if you are right in that leaving a node might be IO or it could just be a variable I set to true. Okay, because this is a threaded code, I don't have to print something. I can just take a Boolean variable and turn it into true. Okay, that's not IO. I'm just flipping a variable. I just write something. I assign a value to a variable, true or false. I don't do any output. Okay, but having said that, if your point is, is there IO? Even with IO, this weird scheduling sequence of my occur. It doesn't mean that the problem is gone. Okay? In this case, you can do this without IO at all. Okay? Any other questions here? Okay, so let's try something else and see if that works. Here is yet another solution okay, to the too much milk problem. Okay? This one is not even symmetric. A and B two two different things. Okay, in case of A, you are going to leave a note. Okay, and while if there is a note from B, you essentially sit there spinning. Okay, you basically just sit in that loop, saying while there is a note, you are just going to keep checking if there is a note. Is there a note. And once the note is gone, okay, then you are going to check if there is milk in the fridge or not, and then you take the note off. Okay, this is if you think about it from a Example perspective, think of this as one roommate is more paramount. Okay? You see a node, so I don't trust whether my roommate is going to buy milk. I'm going to stand at the refrigerator, wait for my roommate to come back and see if they actually did what they said. Okay? So that's what this means. Saying there is a node, so presumably you've gone off to buy milk. So I'm going to sit and wait. Okay? And once you take the note off, I'm going to check did you actually buy milk. And if you did not buy milk, I will go buy milk. If you bought it, then things are good. And A is the same as the old code, where you're simply checking if you have milk, a uh, node from uh, B is going to leave a node, you're going to check if there's a node from A, if not, you go by milk. It's the same as the previous code. You just change the code for one of the two things. You made it case a question in this one. Yes. Uh, how would that happen? The question is, uh, you, you have to find a scheduling sequence. If you find that, then of course there's a problem. So you're saying both would leave a note. Okay, let's say A leaves a note, B leaves a note. While there is a note from B, A is going to sit in the while. Okay, it's not even going to go and do anything. It's just going to sit and spin. Okay, B might actually leave that note and see that A has left the note. So it might say, I don't need to do anything. Okay, and then take the note off. But A is the more paranoid thread, so it will actually check after you took the note of whether you bought milk. In this case, the presence of a note to you indicates milk will appear. Okay? In this case, the presence of a note only tells you that your roommate has gone to buy milk, but you don't trust your roommate, you are going to check after they came back whether you bought milk. So you are doing something different. Okay? Just the note doesn't tell you things will happen, you check afterwards. Any thoughts on this? Okay, so I will assert, okay, without proving anything, that this code is correct. Okay. It actually works. It doesn't matter how things get scheduled. You can try arbitrary scheduling ways to defeat the code and you will see that it still works. Okay. I will not <coughs> prove to you why this works, but there is some explanation on the slide which says let's assume this happens and that happens and regardless of what happens you will see that milk will appear and you won't have a case where no milk appears. Okay, But I will say the following even though I have not proved you the correctness of this you will find that this code is hard to reason with. Okay? It's not trivial to convince yourself that the code is correct. Yeah. First of all the two threads do two different things. What if there were three two not two. How does this generalize? Okay. 
and the second roommate has to be moderately paranoid and the first one is lazy and the second one, third one is extremely paranoid or how, what is the right combination of this, okay? We don't know. Okay, it's hard to figure out how to write code in this fashion. Okay, so this code is not symmetric. Okay, you are not having, the previous two cases A and B had exactly the same code. You are checking for node, checking the statement and then taking the node. In this case, you have asymmetric code. Harder to reason with, harder to figure out that it is actually correct. Not that you couldn't figure out, it's actually hard to figure this out. Because you have to reason about all possibilities. And so you see, does it work every time? Okay. So, the code is correct, but we don't necessarily like writing code in this fashion because it's too complicated. Okay. If I told you to write code of this fashion, this is a very simple piece of code. Think about more complicated tasks that you have to do as a thread. Okay. This is going to make things very complicated. Okay. Threading will not be a right way to do. So, it's too complicated. It's not asymmetric. Okay. There is one more problem which I didn't mention is A is basically sitting here doing what is called busy waiting. Okay. He's just standing by the refrigerator checking is the node still there and so on. And so he's just wasting CPU cycles because not doing anything. It's not gone off to sleep waiting for the node to be taken off. It's continuously checking. Okay. It's wasting the CPU by just doing checks and not doing any useful work. This is called busy waiting. Okay. We are busy waiting in a loop, not doing anything useful. And then you can stand three hours next to the thing waiting for your roommate to come back. You wasted a bunch of time. You could have done other better things in that time. Okay. So this is a phenomenon that we don't want to have in our code, which is called busy wait. Okay. So it has three issues. Okay. One is it's complicated, it's not symmetric, it's hard to reason with, and it has a problem where one thread is wasting our CPU cycles uh, just doing a busy wait. Okay. So we want to come up with a way to write code which will not have all of those problems, it will be very easy to understand that the code actually works. Okay? And this is where synchronization is going to come in. Okay? So far we haven't used anything specific to do synchronization. We just wrote code, we just assume that loads and stores are atomic, which they always are in most uh, hardware and try to write correct code. Okay? So instead what we will do is we will use language level support for synchronization which will make writing this type of code more simple for us. Okay, so we we'll start with locks today. Okay, around the five minutes that we have left, I'm going to introduce locks. Next time we'll talk about semaphores and monitors, okay, uh, which is on Thursday. Okay. So locks are a synchronization primitive that essentially give you mutual exclusion. Okay. A lock has only two methods. Okay. There's an acquire method and a uh, release method. So the acquire method grabs the lock, the release method releases the lock, as the name suggests. Okay. And the rules for using the lock are always straightforward. You should always acquire the lock before accessing shared data. You should always release the lock after you're done with shared data. And initially when the program starts up, process starts up, your lock is going to be free. Okay. So I'm going to show you the too much milk solution using locks. Okay. Now it's going to be essentially with the lock acquire and release a two line solution. Okay, so that's all we are going to do. We are going to say acquire a lock okay, and then check is there milk. If there is no milk, go buy milk and release the lock. And B is going to say acquire the lock, check if there is milk. If there is no milk, go buy milk okay, and release the lock. And that's it. This is a four line solution with lock acquire and release. The actual code is only written two lines of code. And this is going to give us the solution we want. Okay? The reason it's going to give us the solution we want is the properties of a lock. Okay? What the lock acquire has done for us is doesn't matter in which order the CPU scheduler schedules the thread. Okay? The first thread that hits lock acquire will be able to grab the lock. Because the lock is initially free. Okay? One of these two threads is going to get to run first. It's going to grab the lock. And then it's going to basically enter uh, or the critical section or basically go on to the next thread. Once you grab the lock, it doesn't matter what happens next from a, for the other thread's perspective because the second lock acquire will always block. Okay, once one thread has grabbed the lock, lock guarantees to you, the, the implementation of a lock is going to guarantee to you that all subsequent lock acquires will block until the lock is released. Okay, that's the property of a lock. Once a thread has grabbed the lock, 
any other thread that calls lock acquire, we'll have to wait until the thread that holds the lock will call lock release. This by definition ensures that this statement of uh, two statement is a check whether there is milk and go by milk can only be executed by one thread at a time. Because other threads are even prevented from looking at the statement. They will just block and lock at one. They cannot even proceed to the next statement. So put another way, if you are uh, scheduled and you do lock acquire, when lock is in use, you will immediately get descheduled and go on to the wait queue. Okay, it's like doing IO. You cannot run anymore until the thread that holds the lock will do a release. Okay, at that point you will become ready to run again. You might get the lock and you will go to the next thing. Okay, that's the property of a lock. So because of that property, writing synchronization code has become very simple. You can automatically use a lock on any piece of code and ensure that only one thread can even do anything with that code. Okay, other threads are going to be blocked. Okay, so this is going to ensure correctness. So let's stop here. Your question last question. Sorry, what's the waiting problem we look at next time that depends on the system. Thank you.